In the murky world of organised crime, few stories captivate as much as that of Abuzar Sultani. A man who seemingly had it all, a thriving business, a facade of respectability and a network of influential contacts, Sultani's life was anything but ordinary. Beneath the veneer of his success lay a darker reality, a clandestine existence as a hitman for one of Australia's most notorious biker gangs, the Rebels. This video aims to unravel the complexities of Sultani's life, exploring his early beginnings, his transformation from a promising student to a feared criminal, his affiliation with the Rebels Motorcycle Club, the brutal murders he orchestrated, his dramatic trial and the fate that ultimately befell him. This is the story of Abuzar Sultani. Abuzar Sultani's early life seemed like the quintessential story of a family seeking a better future. He was born in January 1989 in Western Sydney to Afghan immigrant parents. His parents left Afghanistan to flee the Soviet occupation of their homeland and settled in Westmead, raising their children in a stable and supportive environment. Sultani's parents, who were conservative and placed immense value on education, strove to instill the same in their children. They were not wealthy, but they saw education as a gateway to a better life, emphasising its importance above all else. Sultani's parents kept a close watch on him, encouraging him to study rather than allowing him to stray into potentially harmful activities. This early life under the watchful eyes of his parents, who wanted nothing more than for him to be good and successful, seemed to lay a strong foundation for a promising future. When Sultani was still young, he and his family moved to Marylands, where he attended Parramatta High School. Here was where his story began to deviate from the typical path of a young immigrant in Australia. Despite the supportive environment at home, Sultani's school life was marked by increasing challenges. Initially, he appeared to fit in well, having a sufficient number of friends and no significant socialisation problems. He was even noted for being above average in subjects like maths and English. However, beneath this premising exterior, Sultani struggled with self-confidence and sensitivity to criticism, issues that would eventually manifest in more troubling behaviours. The turning point in Sultani's school life came in year 8, when he was suspended for teasing another student. This marked the beginning of a pattern of suspensions, particularly for fighting in years 11 and 12, even forcing him to repeat year 12. Sultani maintained that he did not start these fights, but his reactions to criticism and confrontation often led to physical altercations. In 2007, Sultani decided to leave school, only to return at the beginning of the year, realising the importance of obtaining his HSC for future career opportunities. However, the confidence issues and depression he battled led him to act out in harmful ways, such as making fun of others to feel better about himself. Just quickly, if you're enjoying this video so far, please consider subscribing and liking this video, it really helps me out and helps the channel grow. Sultani's first significant brush with the law came when he was involved in a botched attempt to steal an ATM along with seven others, many of whom he knew from high school. The group stole a high ace van and a car from a rental company in Mascot, leading to their arrest. In a sign of things to come, Unlike his co-accused, Sultani refused to make statements about the robbery, adhering to a criminal code of silence. During his time in Silverwater Jail, the psychiatrist's report provided a poignant insight into the young man's psyche. Sultani described a life of internal conflict, marked by a lack of confidence and an inability to express his feelings healthily. His reflections in jail revealed a desire to turn his life around, expressing hopes of obtaining his HSC, attending university to study business and commerce, and ultimately, leading a life incompatible with crime. Despite his intentions to reform, however, it was during his years in prison that his life trajectory shifted. He began to cultivate connections within Sydney's criminal circles, setting the stage for his future as a hitman and gang leader. Following his release from jail in 2009, Sultani attempted to realign his life with his aspirations by successfully completing his HSC with a score in the 70s, although he felt he underachieved. He later completed a commerce degree at Macquarie University in 2014 and then enrolled in an MBA at the same university. His time at university seemed to mark a positive turn in his life, demonstrating his intellectual capabilities and desire to build a legitimate career, but unbeknownst to everyone, he was already living a double life. 
After leaving prison at age 20, he started working for construction identities George Alex and Joseph Antoon in 2012. The years spent working for George Alex and Joe Antoon were pivotal for Sultani as these men were deeply entrenched in the criminal world. George Alex was a well-known figure in the construction industry with links to organised crime and Joe Antoon, a notorious standover man, became a mentor to Sultani. His involvement with Alex and Antoon intensified when he signed a union deal on behalf of Alex with the CFMU's Victorian branch, an agreement arranged by Melbourne underworld figure Mick Gatto. At the time, Sultani was seen as Alex Gopher, a role that allowed him to witness the extensive extortion and intimidation tactics used in the construction industry. Sultani's role involved being listed on business records as a director of Alex's construction and labour hire companies, further entrenching him in the criminal network. The violent nature of the environment he was in became increasingly apparent as Sultani witnessed the murder of three of Alex's business partners in a single year. This violent backdrop pushed Sultani towards joining a gang, seeking protection and a sense of belonging that he felt was necessary for survival. This decision marked his formal entry into the world of organised crime, setting the stage for his future actions. In 2012, Sultani joined the Rebels Motorcycle Club, one of Australia's most notorious outlaw motorcycle gangs. The Rebels, known for their involvement in a wide range of criminal activities including drug trafficking, extortion and violent crime, provided Sultani with the protection and camaraderie he sought. The gang operates as a hierarchical organisation, with various chapters spread across the country, each led by a chapter president. The rebel structure and operations were somewhat akin to a Ponzi scheme, in Sultani's view, where individuals were always seeking a free lunch. Despite this, Sultani saw an opportunity to carve out his own niche within the organisation. He quickly rose through the ranks, leveraging his connections and willingness to engage in violent and criminal activities to establish himself as a key player. During his time with the rebels, Sultani used his position to cover his criminal enterprises. He engaged in extortion, intimidation and other illegal activities under the guise of legitimate business dealings associated with the gang. This dual existence allowed him to build a reputation within the criminal underworld while maintaining a facade of legitimacy. Sultani's rise within the rebels culminated in 2014 when he became the leader of the Burwood chapter. This position not only solidified his status within the gang, but also gave him significant influence and control over the chapter's operations. As the chapter president, Sultani was responsible for coordinating the gang's activities, which included both legal and illegal enterprises. Under his leadership, the Burwood chapter became known for its ruthlessness and efficiency. Sultani's reputation as a feared gangland figure grew, and he used his position to expand his criminal network. He was not content with the traditional bikey model, and sought to establish a more sophisticated and lucrative criminal enterprise. By 2016, Sultani had grown disillusioned with the rebels, viewing the gang's operations as limiting and unprofitable. He decided to break away and form his own crew, which became known as Murder Crew 13. This new crew was a sophisticated and ruthless group, specialising in contract killings and other high-risk criminal activities. Sultani's crew quickly gained notoriety for their violent methods and willingness to take on dangerous assignments. The crew's activities were marked by meticulous planning and a callous disregard for human life, leading to a spree of violence that left a trail of bodies across Sydney. The first known murder linked to Sultani's crew was that of Nicola Sprin in 2013. Nicola, an 18-year-old low-level drug dealer, was targeted after becoming involved in a serious assault on a drug runner supplied by Sultani. The attack on Nicola was carried out by a group of men assembled at Sultani's orders and resulted in the teenager's death from severe head injuries. Sultani later expressed regret for the murder, describing it as an unintended outcome of a confrontation that escalated beyond his control. He admitted to a forensic psychologist that the plan was not to kill Nicola, but to confront him and resolve the situation. The brutal nature of the attack highlighted the volatility and violence that characterised Sultani's criminal activities. The second victim was Mark Easter, a former member of the Rebels bikey gang, who became a target due to his association with the gang and the perceived threats he posed. 
Easter went missing before his body was discovered on June 23rd, 2015, dumped in bushland with four bullet wounds to the back of his head. According to Sultani, he was killed during a high stakes meeting at a Dundas Valley home. The confrontation, which was initially about a drug deal, turned violent as Easter, armed and increasingly agitated, pointed his gun at Sultani. Feeling an imminent threat, Sultani seized the chance to grab the firearm and shot Easter multiple times. The murder was driven by a mix of personal and criminal factors, including a $50,000 debt Easter owed Sultani and tensions from Sultani's rebels gang chapter breaking away from the main organisation. To conceal his crime, Sultani submerged Easter's body in bleach and ice before disposing of it in bushland, highlighting the brutal nature of gangland violence and internal rivalries. On March 30th, 2016, Michael Davey, a member of the Penrith chapter of the Rebels, was killed after being shot multiple times outside his Kingswood home. There had been tensions between Sultani's crew and the Penrith rebels, and the murder was believed to be linked to a bad pseudo deal involving Davy. Davy's murder was the beginning of a series of gangland killings that occurred in 2016. The murder of Mehmet Yilmaz on September 9th, 2016, further cemented Sultani's reputation as a ruthless enforcer. Yilmaz, an associate of the Comanchero Motorcycle Club, was killed in front of his partner in St. Mary's. The killing was linked to a dispute over a $20,000 drug debt involving a lone wolf bikey, an associate of Sultani. The public nature of the murder and its connection to the ongoing gang conflict highlighted the escalating violence in Sydney's criminal underworld. The final victim, Pasquale Barbaro, was murdered on November 14th, 2016. His murder was perhaps the most significant and personal of Sultani's crimes. Barbaro, a notorious mafia identity, had been implicated in the murder of Sultani's mentor, Joe Antoon, whose death in December 2013 was a turning point for Sultani. Antoon was shot dead at his home in Strathfield, a violent end orchestrated by rivals within the criminal world. The exact details of who orchestrated Antun's murder remain complex, involving various figures in the underworld. However, it was widely believed that Pasquale Barbaro had a significant role in the orchestration, leading to Sultani's desire for revenge. Barbaro was sitting in his Mercedes when an Audi Q7 pulled up alongside his car. One member of Sultani's crew, positioned in the back of the Audi, fired multiple shots into Barbaro's vehicle. Barbaro attempted to flee, but Sultani himself pursued him, firing several rounds into his body as he collapsed on the ground. In the days following the murder, Sultani left flowers at Antun's grave, signalling his sense of fulfilment and closure. If you want to know more about the life and death of Pasquale Barbaro, make sure you check out my video on him after this. The end of Sultani and his crew came swiftly, within two weeks of Barbaro's murder. Surveillance operations, including the bugging of Sultani's Subaru WRX and his apartment, played a crucial role in their capture. Despite initial setbacks, the breakthrough came when police decrypted a series of emails on the gang's encrypted BlackBerry phones. The investigators managed to piece together these encrypted exchanges, solidifying the case against the killers and linking them to multiple murders, drug trafficking and other organised crime activities. At 27 years old, the promising academic by day and ruthless hitman by night was arrested. Sultani, along with his henchmen Sir Munchizada, Joshua Baines and Mirwais Danishar, faced multiple trials over the course of 12 months. The trials were held under strict suppression orders, preventing media coverage until December 2021. Siar Munchizada, described as Sultani's foot soldier, was found guilty of the murders of Davy, Yilmaz and Barbaro. Despite his lawyer's argument that he was merely a pawn in Sultani's game, the court sentenced him to three consecutive life sentences. Joshua Baines received a 36-year prison term for his role in Barbaro's murder, while Mirwais Danisha was jailed for at least 11 years as an accessory. While his associates were convicted after lengthy court proceedings, in 2019, Sultani pleaded guilty to the murders of Michael Davy, Mehmet Yilmaz and Pasquale Barbaro. Sultani's justification for his actions was a twisted sense of desensitisation to violence, driven by ongoing threats to his life. 
He was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole, with Justice Desfagan labelling him a serial killer. These sentences marked the culmination of one of Sydney's most significant murder cases, bringing an end to the violent reign of Sultani's gang. In October 2022, Sultani pleaded guilty to the murder of Nicola Sprin, receiving an additional 20-year sentence. He has also been sentenced to another 28 years in jail for a raft of charges including selling and possessing guns, drug supply and directing his criminal network. In April 2024, after pleading guilty to the murder of Mark Easter, he was sentenced to the maximum term of 31 years and 6 months with a non-parole period of 23 years. In delivering his sentence, the judge took into account Sultani's guilty plea, but he noted the penalty would be academic in terms of its impact on the offender's life, given he was already serving three life terms behind bars. At the age of 35, convicted of five murders and facing a total of 209 years in prison, Sultani has established himself as one of Australia's most prolific killers. From his early years as a promising student to his rise as a feared hitman, Sultani's life reflects the complexities of living a double life and the dangers of pursuing power and wealth at any cost. His ability to maintain a facade of respectability while orchestrating violent acts demonstrates the extent of depravity that can exist within individuals driven by ambition and greed. As Sultani serves his life sentences, his story serves as a powerful reminder of the consequences of crime and the importance of vigilance and integrity in preventing and addressing criminal activities. The impact of his actions on the community and the justice system highlights the enduring fight for justice and the hope that truth and integrity will ultimately prevail. As always, if you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. Till next time, take care.